Hello, motor enthusiasts and fans of BS. Welcome to episode 18 of Motor BS with Brian and Sean. Hello, Sean. Hello, beautiful people. Hello, Brian. Oh, man, I thought you were going to call me beautiful for a second. And I was like, <gasps> and then I was like, oh, damn. There's a guy at work that <laughs> every time we join a call, he calls everybody beautiful people. Uh, hello, beautiful people. Hello, beautiful people. So, hey, we're sporting the same shirt today. I know. We're getting ready for bike night. Yeah, bike w- night. Yeah, we went last week and it was kind of a fail because we were like, man, there's like, 5,000 people here, and we could have had our shirts on. <laughs> yeah, missed opportunity. Yeah, so we're going to go back this week and parade around. I can't believe that that is every week. Yeah, you're like, how often do they do that? I'm like, every week? And you're like, no way. I'm like, yeah. Every- That's quite an event for every week. I mean, what was the estimate of bikes there? I would say probably really 250, maybe. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but it, it was a lot. I mean, it was a lot. It looked like, you know, the amount of bikes that we see at like DGR or something. Yeah. It's mostly sport bikes, I think. Big contingent of sport bikes, a handful of The Bay Area Riders is kind of a more a sport bike I think community. So. Yeah. 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 I they think actually so. they, they do a lot of big rides and stuff too. So they're they're pretty well organized. We'll have to see if we can I've met the guy that runs it. I can't remember his name right now, but we'll have to we'll see if we can look him up tonight. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah. Um I think Jose is coming tonight, maybe John. John for sure, yeah. A couple of our, our riding buddies. And uh yeah, we'll have a little contingent there. Yeah, we saw some interesting bikes there last week. Quite a few CF Moto, actually. Yeah, that was the surprise last week. Because remember, that was the joke we were talking in the CF Moto episode. We were like, well, people want to be seen a bike night on these. But I, the answer to that is apparently yes. Like, they were all decked out with, like, graphics on the side and everything. Like, yeah. CF Moto graphics. Like, just like they were a... Suzuki or... or yeah. Hayabusa or whatever. Right, <laughs> yeah. So speaking of Hayabusa's, how about that one with the turbo on it? Yeah, those were pretty pretty slick yeah yeah like you could tell like the guy did it like he custom because he had to cut out of the um the fairing the fairing yeah yeah Yeah. and they had extended uh which i see that quite a bit yeah the extended swing arms pretty popular the one looked a little sketchy it looked like they made it out of an erector set but yeah it looked like if it was you know like it just could have bent yeah like it (laughs) it was pretty long (laughs) But, you know, like I was saying that night, I totally get the Hayabusa. I used to mock him a lot because right. they kind of have a stereotype. But I get it here in Florida because the roads are so straight. You know, these guys are just, they're all about the straight line speed, you know? Yeah. So it's a big engine, 1300, something like that. Something like that. But it, I mean, I think, can't they go up to like 200 miles an hour? I think so. Yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty insane. I think they're like legit 200 mile an hour bikes. Which is, yeah, I don't know. I don't have those kind of balls anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Probably if I had that bike when I was like 25, I definitely would have tried that. But right. <laughs> now I'm just like, yeah, I got to like 130 on my bike once. And I was like, yeah, that's enough. So yeah. That's enough. Yeah. And that was on like the most open straightaway, no traffic, no no entrances for houses or anything that no car could pull out in front of me. Kind of, I mean, obviously a deer or raccoon can wander out in front of you or something. I, I never exceed the speed limit. Yeah. Ever. It just it's just goes against who I am. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> if my mom's watching, I don't. Yeah, either. I don't either. We, mom, we we just don't. <laughs> we're we're very responsible and uh, safe riders. Exactly. So uh, yeah, so we're excited to go back tonight. Pass out a few stickers, hang around, check out some cool bikes, maybe get something to eat. And uh, yeah, they had the. Uh, they had the sheriff's department out there too. They had like three of their vehicles. They had a like. The challenger or whatever like the uh yeah what do you call those pursuit vehicle the like unmarked the, unmarked that's it unmarked. yeah but of course they had all the lights on so it was all it looked like a christmas tree out there and then they had like their harley and then the one ducati multistrada that i think actually um tampa bay tampa uh, ducati tampa bay made for them oh okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's cool they have a, a presence there and they're just hanging out yeah they were know? just hanging out yeah yeah they'll let you take pictures with them or whatever yeah I think those car, those unmarked cars like that, when they have like the Mustangs and the Challenger, I think those are like Repo, um, or like a confiscated, confiscated cars. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, but okay. I, I guess as long as it wasn't your car, <laughs> repurposing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I did post a little clip of last week's bike night, just yes. so everybody can see a little. You know, yeah, I saw that. A little couple, a couple minutes, a couple of those AI songs in there. Yeah, G- digging the AI. It's a uh, they. They don't sound like robots, which is pretty... And it, it took me all of... Well, you wrote the lyrics to the one rap well, song. Well, I didn't write it. I actually asked AI. Like I said, AI, will you write us a, a rap song about... Because you've been doing all these 
different songs like in the opening for like Beatles and soul and country and all that. So, right. so I was like, oh, we should do a rap one. So I asked AI to write us a rap. I was considering trying it myself, but I was like, when you let the AI do it, it was probably way better than I could do. So, so it's funny because you had AI um, write the lyrics. Yeah. I took those lyrics and plugged them into a different AI app. Yeah. And it generated the song, the music, the beat and everything underneath yeah, it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's honestly, dual. yeah, it, it, it makes you question like, why some of these guys are so famous. <laughs> Makes you wonder if we're listening to things that have been AI created. Right. Because <laughs> honestly, it, it sounded just as good as any, not any, but most of the rap songs that, there are some that are like higher, like more elevated art, but a lot of them are just, you know. Well, it definitely sounded like a legit um, like television show or radio show theme song. You know what I mean? Right, right. I mean, it was totally legit. Um, and the cool thing about that is it literally, I mean, from the time I I found the page, typed in a little sentence description, and then downloaded the MP3, I mean, all of about a minute. And I, I'm not exaggerating. I know, that's pretty insane. Imagine where we'll be five years from now. Right. Ten years from now. I mean, it's just... Yeah, no, I hear a lot of content creators complaining like oh they're trying to replace the writers they can't do it or whatever and it's not there yet especially Mm -hmm. for like writing comedy or whatever but it's coming (laughs) yeah and i think it's it's dependent on the on what algorithm what app you're using plus because last year i heard not to go down not to digress too much but last year i heard um an ai version of like a what if scenario with the Beatles. Yeah. It was almost. I, I see some of those, like, oh, what if, uh, you know, Stain saying, you know, come together or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, that is, that's Stain singing come together. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's just like. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Wow. Mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, I thought we'd start us a, a little week in review. Last week, I, I mentioned I was um, about I had the show and tell with my oh, new turn signals, right. so I wanted to provide an update that I got those installed. So I'm excited tonight to not flap down the highway. Okay. So I've got like my little micro turn signals installed, and they are incredibly bright. Oh, I'm interested to see them. They are so bright that when I was adjusting them, I blinded myself, and I had to wait like 15 minutes for the dot to go away, because <laughs> I couldn't see anything. Yeah, I know um, Brandon was pretty impressed, because he said he'd seen them online, and even knowing they were small, he didn't realize they were that, because they were really tiny. Like, yeah, very they were like small. the size of a dime. The only thing that I was a little put off about was, you know, it has the um, the the insulated cable that comes out of it, and... I snipped my OEM, you know, so I could sp- splice them in. Yeah. The the wire gauge on the little micro ones, I think I've seen horsetail hair thicker than that wire. Oh, it's pretty pretty. Small. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, I soldered them because I didn't trust any connector I had, right. crimp connector. So I soldered them, and, you know, they're cool, but my gosh, they were thin. Yeah. Yeah, it probably doesn't take much power for those. Not either. for LEDs, right? Yeah. For a single LED. So anyway, but that's that. Um, what else did we do this week? So luggage, you got a new thing. And yeah, so it, my cousin Brandon that was on last week, he was going through his grandpa's stuff and he found like a, a Givy, is that how you say it? G-I-V-I. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's a pretty popular luggage manufacturer. They make all the hard cases for every kind of bike. Uh, but he had like a black one with the the red like tail lights on it. Um, it was a little scratched, a little beat up. But I mean, uh, and I never, I don't really like the top case look on a bike. I would never just ride around with it on there. But it has the mono key system, which basically it took us. It was so funny because there was three of us like out there looking at it, trying to figure out how to, even just how to close the stupid thing. I had to go on to Reddit because you literally like you, you shut it and then you like you press the thing in or whatever but like we were we were slamming it and you would think it would just shut but it doesn't you have to actually press this like panel in but then it has like a key system so you can lock it but you also can so it has like two little slots in the front of the bag so you slide them onto the onto the plate and then it sits down onto a third um thing that sticks up like the size of your thumb and has like a little notch in it and so when that sticks down there you turn that key and it locks it into there and that's it now it's locked onto your bike okay without having to like go through all these 
you don't have to tie it down or anything. And then when you want to undo it, you just literally just turn the key and lift it up and it comes right off. And you can carry it into a hotel like a suitcase. You could if you you could if you wanted to. I mean, I would on the trip. I'll probably just leave it on the bike if I end up taking it. I haven't decided yet. I had to I had to go to um, Revzilla and I ordered, which they came overnight. That's the RPM program for you. Like wow, it went from like nine ninety nine shipping to when I plugged in my RPM membership. It said free shipping, and they it literally came like a day and a half later. Yeah, their their shipping's amazing. Yeah, so it. So they have they sell like an entire plate that you can put on the back of your bike. I had just bought a brand new plate to like set my luggage on. And this the plate that I bought is big enough, but it doesn't have the like correct holes. But really all you gotta do is like drill three holes in it and then put the hardware in in the right place. So that's gonna be the fun part. I'll have to make like a um I'll have to make a little uh, template. You know? Yeah. You'll have to shoot me a picture so we can put it up so people. Yeah, can I'll, see. I'll shoot. You. I took a picture. I just set it on the back of the bike and took a picture to see what it looked like, you know. And it, it looks all right. Like it, it kind of matches, you know. Right. And it actually has like a backrest on it, which you can take off, and I may take it off since I, you know, I'm not going to have somebody riding on the back anyway right now. But but that's going to give you a lot of extra space for your trip. Yeah, I, I, it's like a 46 liter case, and like I put I put a full size helmet in there. You could probably put two in there side by side. But My gosh. Dude, yeah. It must be huge. Yeah, I mean it's it doesn't really look as big as some of them I've seen, but yeah, it's, you know, whatever. It's nice. Yeah. It's maybe a foot by a foot and a half or two feet wide or whatever. Um, and then, you know, 12 inches tall or so. Very cool. Yeah. What is cool about it? Like my bag has, my bike has the hard bags, but they, when you open the sides kind of fall out, you know what I mean? And so putting stuff in there is kind of a pain in the ass because like you, you can't just put something in there without it just kind of wanting to fall out you, it'll hold a full-size helmet which is not that big of a deal but if you want to put like you know a water and some gloves and whatever everything kind of just slides mm. around there so unless you have a separate bag inside of the bag gotcha yeah it, it just makes it difficult to use whereas this one's a you know it opens like a suitcase so you can set stuff down inside of it without having it fall out right yeah so i'm gonna give it a shot i like i said if all i gotta do is put those three three holes in that thing and then I could still, if I choose not to use it, I can just still strap a bag to it. Or like the boys on uh, 44 Teeth, what they did is they turned it into a, um, a, a fountain drink for <laughs> liquor. And they had different pool, <laughs> different pools. So then when they stopped to camp... Uh, okay, yeah. That's pretty funny. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, what else is going on? We got, a, we got an order of t-shirts in. We did. Yep. That's why we're just, sporting these tonight. Like this one here. Yep. And um, if anybody wants a t-shirt, yeah, hit us I up. I think we have about 10 left or so. I mean, I got 24. Um, but, it, you know, you had your order for your family and friends. And I've given one to everybody that's been on the show and or supported us. So I've got about, got like one small left and a couple of mediums, a couple of larges, a couple of XLs. I, th- I think I got one 2XL. I kind of got that one for our friend David because... You know, the last time I ordered shirts for the for our classic riders, he's like, "You got any two XL or whatever?" And I was like, "No." <laughs> he's a big dude. He's like, you know, well, six five, right. two seventy, kind of former football player guy. Well, technically, they're for sale, right? But yes, if you yeah. give us if you give us a really good like case for sending you one, <laughs> exactly, we'll, we'll we'll evaluate it on a case by case. <laughs> like I said, so far it's just been. Family and like close friends, but yeah, yeah. If anybody uh, anybody wants to buy one, I, we're just selling them for cost right now. We're gonna set up a store down the road, but yeah, like you know, fifteen bucks. Shoot us fifteen bucks, and you can have one. Hit us up on how can they get a hold of us? I think um, I think YouTube has an email, and maybe we have we have a Gmail. It's uh, motobs at gmail.com. I'll look it up before the end of the show, and oh, yeah, and we'll give it, it out at the end. Is it motobs podcast or is it motob? I forgot. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure that out. And I'll put it in the description. There you go. I'll put it in the description of both the audio podcast and the video on it YouTube. It is themotobs at gmail.com. Themotobs. Yep, that's it. Themotobs at gmail.com. There you go. Yeah, so send us an email there, and uh, we will uh, hook you up. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, are we ready for our first segment tonight? Yeah, sure. So this is called, this segment's called In the News. All right. In the news, news, news. Okay. Ticker tape. Yeah. Um, or whatever they call it. I don't know what a ticker tape is. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm, not, stock that, market I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> teletype. Teletype. There we that's, go. That's, that's the it. one. Yeah. yeah. 
What a, what the heck is a ticker tape? Ticker tape ticker tape is the thing that the stock market used to print out back before computers. Because I the only reference I really know from that is like at the end of World War Two. Yeah. On V Day, they were you know. Yeah, they were they had ticker tape parade. They would just because they throw were going through New York and they were just throwing yeah. it out because they had all that. I guess during the day as the stocks would go up and down, they would literally print out these little strips of paper, like with the with the prices on it, which is kind of like they do now, the scroll on the bottom of, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. See the stock prices on there. So in the news, so I want to start off with just a quick little, um, uh, you know, it, we've talked about this a few times on the episode in the past few weeks, but there was some controversy with Harley Davidson. Again. Again, where some, you know, some people leaked out that they had some pretty, um, some pretty, how would you phrase it? Uh, some woke yeah, I guess. things that were happening um, within the company. Which some, is kind of funny, considering their demographic, you know. Considering their demographic, which is, I think, why it made such a big right. ripple or wave or however you want to say it. But um, it, it, it made its round on X and in the news media. If you go to Google News and type in Harley Davidson, it'll just be dozens of articles about this. So it's it's really making the rounds. But Harley this week finally officially released an, an official statement okay. saying that they pulled back all these programs that they were doing, right? You know, trying to just calm calm things down a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's interesting. Yeah, I know um, there was another article I saw about them moving some of the manufacturing uh, to, was it like Thailand or something? I guess we'll have to see if it actually affects their their sales or whatever. I, well, well, that's why I wanted to, so where I was going with this too, is that Sturgis happened a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. You were saying that the, the tent was like less crowded than normal. Yeah. Their whole, their whole setup that they had there was in a few of the articles I read said that like it was really empty. And then I read an article the other day that said they closed up camp. They, they packed up and left two days before Sturgis ended, which was very unlike them. Yeah. That, Sounds kind of crazy, actually. So, what about Indian? Like, did they pick up the slack, or? Well, you know, that's where that's a great question because all these people on like X and things that are you know commenting on this article or or on this official statement, they're like, "I'm selling my Harley. I'm buying an Indian." I was looking, so I, I was googling after you told me we we're gonna be talking about this, like. Indian models compared to like Harley models just to see like what they're, you know, like what their equivalent of a road glide or whatever. And honestly, the Indian prices were, they were a little bit more <laughs> than Harley for some of their. Like, I noticed that I actually have a few up here. Yeah. I saw that when you, when you clicked, I mean, those are like the low end stuff there, the scout sixties, kind of like their sportster. And uh, if you go up here to like elite, yeah, I mean, here's one for $40,000, right? The Roadmaster elite. The Indian Challenger Elite, the Roadmaster Elite forty two like thousand. Those the road glides or whatever. Yeah, like like Teresa has fully decked out touring bikes. Yeah, and I'm sure when you go in to pick it up, they'll be like, "Oh, you you want silver paint? That's another five hundred bucks." Yeah. Yep. Now, speaking about Indian, though, does Indian fill the gap? Is it an honest replacement with Harley? I mean, I think they're very similar. Like, they look, to me, I mean, I think they look cooler, actually, for the most part, when I see them in person. But it's obviously a matter of taste. Because they have, they, like, they have the Indian Springfield there. It looks more like a classic older bike. Let's see. Heritage, yeah. Super Chief. What's the cruiser line here? Oh, okay, yeah. the Scout line. Yeah, the Scout line. I mean, those are actually pretty reasonable. They also have the FTR, which is kind of an interesting... Um, and that's in standard. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, it's like a naked sport bike, basically. Which is a really cool looking bike. Yeah, it's got a trellis chassis. Yeah, everybody says they're a blaster ride. 120, 120 horsepower. horsepower. Yeah, it's 1,200. Yeah. Now, here's the thing that I, I was doing some searching around. It seems to me, and I could be wrong, please correct me in the comments, um you know, shoot us an email or whatever, but I couldn't find a standalone Indian dealership. No, I mean... That's equivalent to like Harley, where it's a, right. it's a whole Indian it's a boutique, experience. Yeah. You know, right? Like the one, the biggest one I know of around here is, is Maramoto on um, Dale Mabry. 
And they also have KTM and Yamaha and I think maybe even another Japanese bike. I can't remember for sure. But it did, they definitely have Yamaha and KTM mm-hmm. in there as well as Indian. Now, they do have the whole front of the store is dedicated to Indian. Right. And it's, you know, it's it's like its own section, you know, with the leather couches and, and all the displays and stuff. Okay. And then the back of the store is where they keep the KTMs and the Japanese bikes. But I did see that Lakeland dealership um, here in Florida is like very Indian focus, like the building outside it has, you know, Indian on it. Right. And they you go to their website, and it's all Indian. It's a very Indian focus, but they sell other brands too. Right. It's not just, it's not like that Harley. So I guess where I'm going with that yeah, is Yeah, because like, you're not going to go into Harley and find some Hondas in there. No. There's nothing in a Harley dealership but Harley. I don't even know if they have like used stuff yeah i was just i'm just trying to think now when we walked around uh newport richie harley there were there any used bikes in there they must they must they must have been on the other side or something yeah but i i have a feeling that harley probably sends those off to auction pretty quick yeah i don't think you know like you even go to like ducati tampa bay which is an exclusive ducati dealership they have the half the store in there with their use their trade-in bikes and they've got a huge selection they've got harleys and Yamaha and anything you can think of in there. I mean, if right. I was looking for a used bike, I'd probably be the first place I went because they have such a variety and the prices are pretty good. Where's that? At Ducati. Oh, yeah. I mean, that the entire right side of the Ducati, which is a huge store, but the entire right side is all ex- exclusively Ducati. I mean, they've got hundreds of yeah. brand new Ducatis in there. But then on the other side of the store, they've got they've got cruisers and, and they got a whole Harley section and Indians and... right. And then other Italian bikes over there, like some of the other, which they also sell in, in Largo. But yeah, I think it's interesting how Harley is able to do that, keep their dealerships exclusive and be so huge. I mean, it's a cultural, you know, and not to, not to go, we already did a, an episode on this, but Harley is this cultural icon. Right. And I'm just, I'm, I, my question is, does Indian replace it? I, I don't think they have the... Well, one, you know, they kind of went out of business for a few decades there. And, and aren't they, they're made by like a snowmobile company now, right? Like does Polaris. Polaris yeah. makes them, yeah. Are they, they're not even an American company, are they? Yeah, they're American. Oh, are they? Yeah. Okay, I thought maybe they're Canadian or something. I I thought so too. I always get them in um, Bomb, Bombardier, Bombardier mixed yeah. up. But yeah, Polaris is, is US based. Okay. Um, so they are a US brand. And I mean, obviously the heritage is US, but... And other brands have that same problem too. I mean, even Triumph, where you know it, they went out of business and somebody yeah, bought res- the name and resurrected, them, resurrected yeah. them, right? And they're still designed in in Britain, and you know some of the bikes are still manufactured there. Although I think a, a large majority of them are made in Thailand now. Mine was, yeah, which is fine. Yeah. You know, I mean, everything yeah. is made somewhere else now. Even the things that are made here are not made here; like they're assembled here. Yeah. Like actually, like a lot of the cars, even Toyota and stuff, have plants here, assembly plants. But the parts, well, we we ship the steel over there, and then they they press the parts and they send them back. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I think it's. I, I just think it's an interesting topic where we don't have a lot of American um, mo- motorcycle brands. Basically, two, unless you start including in all the boutique. Builders, yeah, they have a right? lot of boutique brands and electric and stuff like that. Which, yeah. You know, Harley spun off their electric and. I think, uh, what do you got up there? U- Ula? What is it? Ola. Ola. Ola Electric. Yeah. That's Indian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that one, I, yeah, I had in the news for an announcement this week. Are we done with the Harley thing now? I mean, I, it's, it's up to you. Um, yeah. I mean, I didn't have anything else to add to that other What's than... What's a metric cruise? Is that like uh, the British? I mean, I'm sorry, the... Um, All the Japanese brands. Japanese and, yeah. and possibly even um, BMW, right? Yeah, I, th- I guess they'd be considered metric. Cruisers, yeah, because they—I yeah. mean—they have a cruiser line. I think they're kind of hideous, but right. Oh yeah, I put that on there because I had a little story to tell. In that, my first bike was a metric cruiser. It was a Suzuki Cruiser, mm-hmm. and like a Boulevard or something. It was um, um, Intruder. Oh, I remember those. Yeah, it was a pretty goofy, like uncle bike, but yeah. it was a hand-me-down. It was inexpensive, and it ran right. Um, 
It ran great. It stopped like a you know a freight train. I think freight trains actually stop better than that bike. <laughs> Probably. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll keep this story short. But I had this bike, and my my good buddy surprised me a couple of months later, and he rolled up to my house on a motorcycle. Hmm. Well, he didn't ride, right? He he kept this from me. It was, it was a surprise. He pulled up on a brand new, right out of the showroom, uh, Yamaha V-Star. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now, Yamaha used to have this whole line of cruisers in the, the V-Star line. Um, and this thing was beautiful. Was silver paint job, you know, sp- sparkly, more chrome than a, than a 50s Cadillac. I mean, it was gorgeous. Right. Uh, so he said, hey, a couple of weeks later, you know, we, we would ride and everything. And a month or so later, he said, hey, some buddies at work, they ride Harleys and they're doing a poker run. You want to join us? I said, sure. We go to this poker run. We were so ostracized. <laughs> I mean, just like totally. And um, a couple of weeks later, he traded it in for a Harley and never looked back. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think they're quite as strict as they used to be as far as, you know, like making you feel like an outsider. I've been to quite a few events now at Harley based dealership events and rides and stuff. And, you know, I don't think anybody really cares anymore too much. Right. I'm sure they wouldn't let you join their club or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. These weren't club guys, but they were just like, well, I don't even mean like the full club. I just mean like, you know, riders group. You're not going to probably invite you to a lot of the, their little, they're a little clicks, but yeah. but if you come to like a charity run or something, they're not gonna they're not gonna turn their nose up at you, you know. But the the other thing is um, the the engine because they always say, oh well, what makes a Harley a Harley? And there's oh, it's always it's the engine. The the Japanese the metric cruisers are all like most of them are like ninety degree V twins. Right. They're very balanced and smooth. And the Harleys are what are they? Sixty degree, I think. I'm not sure. Makes the definitely. potato, potato, yeah. potato thing. Yeah. But um, they say that's the DNA of a Harley. I wonder um, what the uh, sales figures are like comparative between like Indian and Harley. Like, is it like ten to one or? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I wonder if I could dig up some numbers real quick. Um, I did see that you know for our other Harley episode, maybe it was the one Reese was on or something, but. Every uh, Harley sells w- one of out of every three motorcycles is a Harley. Right, sold in the U.S. You know what I was curious about though, Brian was Japanese bikes that still Japanese manufacturers that still offer cruisers because the V Star line from Yamaha is gone. Right, the only thing left is a little teeny tiny motorcycle. Well, Suzuki's got the Boulevard, right? Is that what you just said? Yeah, about? Suzuki is the boulevard. Look at this little guy. Oh this my. Is, it's a little starter bike. Yeah. But what I thought was so funny about it is that it reminds me of my intruder. I mean, this is going... You want retro? This is going right back to the 80s. 5000 5, bucks, and it's a Yamaha. What is that? It's a V-Star. Oh, V-Star. Okay. V-Star 250. So it's a 250cc v, uh, V-Twin. Yeah, it looks like something uh, Fonzie would ride. Yeah, it's pretty. And of course, they, they have it with a young lady here to show that, hey, this is a great bike to learn on. Yeah, actually, you know? almost every picture. Is, yeah, all, all the pictures are with the woman on them. Yeah. Yeah. Probably very, very... Um, very low to the ground. Low yeah. to the ground, very lightweight. But I thought that was that was interesting. Spoke wheels. MSRP is $4,700. So there you go. Yeah. Brand new spanking bike out of the out of the dealership probably like 25 horsepower or probably yeah so probably, i'm sure it doesn't even say you know, they wouldn't tell you right so yamaha doesn't offer any other cruiser right no they've i mean every, everything's gone sport bike or adventure bike or naked yep. basically i mean they have the sport heritage the um xsr 900 which, some standard yeah yeah like a retro looking they have the xsr 700 yeah the bolt bike's hideous the bolt and then if we jump over to kawasaki they have their vulcan line yeah that's a pretty like the vulcan s is kind of like a starter it's got the little ninja engine on it um i think it's like a 600 or 650 and then i've got the 900 they got a 1700 that's like a that that looks like a legit like harley right replica right (laughs) yeah it's got the 
full fairing and the big bags on it. And you can it, definitely take that on a cruise. And MSRP on that, well, I just saw it. Where was it? They're not going to show me. I have to go back here. MSRP, $20,000. That's, that's a good deal. So compared to Indian, thir- you know, what were we seeing Some there? Some of them were 40 Yeah. So that's a pretty good bargain, you know. That you can I mean, always... if I was, was going to go that route for like that size bike to do like a cross country cruise, I would still probably lean towards like a BMW like sixteen hundred or something. Hmm. You know, just power and handling and everything is just you know, right. And you still have all the comfort and all the bags. And if you had a if you, if you had a pillion with you, you know, p- perfect seating for them. Here's uh, Suzuki's cruiser lineup, and they have one of those old, like, heritage-style Harley. Yeah, with the big white, I mean, big uh, glass um, yeah, like windscreen. Old, yeah, old school. Like, it looks like a Chips motorcycle from the 80s or something. I, every time I see that, I think of, like, a poli- retro police bike. Yeah, right? that's what it looks like. Put yeah. a red light on the back or something. You, it's a cop bike. Yeah. Um, 10, 000, just a little over $10,000. Very much like that one Indian we just looked at, right? Which was a lot more. So yeah, there's still the the Japanese are still offering them. They're still out there. Here's one here, smaller engine, under ten thousand dollars. I I remember um, there was a woman that used to ride with us, come to some of the meetings. I think she was on like a Boulevard. But you see the bike and like you're, it's a legit like full size cruiser. Yeah. Know? And they run forever. Right. Change the oil every once in a while and you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, they, they probably have a lot cheaper maintenance too. Yeah. Than so, Harley or BMW or Ducati or I mean Ducati has no cruisers, right? It's it's all sport bikes and adventure. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Like American style cruiser. Like yeah, there's, these yeah, things. there's nothing. Yeah. There's, Harley I don't think any I guess maybe Moto Guzzi has the little they have the little standard bike, the little um stone was a V V7, what is it called? V7 or something? Or V7, that's the one. I know that one. Oh, I just saw this today, too, that um, they re they re uh, did their their name for California. They have a model called the California, which is a cruiser like so that's that. That's one our friend Frank bought that he only had it for a couple of months. That's the one he drove into the ditch when we went on that, that, uh, that ride to uh, Cedar Key. Re-registered. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Yeah. So what's it called now? California. Oh, so they they brought the California back, or they changed? Well, the name? that's the speculation. They don't, it's not announced yet, but they re-registered the name. Oh, I see. Re-register. I got you. And in the U.S., this this video was saying that in the U.S., if you re-register the name, you have to have intent of actually putting it on a product. Okay. So, the speculation now is they're going to bring back the California. Yeah. Yeah, see an old like American style cruiser there. Yeah, I remember um it was a big beast of a bike too, like a seven, eight hundred pound bike. Kinda looks like that. Um you know, Triumph has it too in the um the, the, the old rockets before they Oh, what's the uh, Speed uh, Speedmaster? Speedmaster, yeah. yeah the Speedmaster the problem with Speedmaster is it it's kind of small scale. Like it looks like somebody took a like a Harley and they, they shot it with one of those shrink rays and it just went whoop, you know. Like I sit on it, I look at bear sitting on it, and I'm not that big of a guy. I'm you know I'm six three or six two, but I'm not like huge. But when I sit on it, I feel big. You know what I mean? Hmm. Versus like sitting on like a Harley or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't see a lot of these around. I think um I think actually our friend Jose bought a, a Speedmaster. That was his first bike when he got back into riding. He bought one and he only had it for mm. a little while before he he uh, switched and got the Bonneville. But when we go to bike night tonight, let's yeah. let's see if we see Japanese cruisers. Cruisers. Yeah, yeah. They had they had a lot. They had like a little section of um, Harley's. Well, yeah, but then they also had a section of like the small displacement bikes, the little uh, monkeys, and uh, yeah, they had the the what are those uh, ruckus? That's that's what they call the little flat uh, ones with the engine on the back. They look like power scooters, basically. Yeah. They call them a ruckus. Yeah, they had some that were pretty well decked out. The um, where they where they stretch them out a little bit. Eighteen hundred bucks. Yeah, they look like a blast, though. It's considered a moped, California legal. And then they customize them. They yeah, do their own yeah, they customize them. They, them. Yeah, I mean, look at that one though. It's got like a legit exhaust and everything on it too. Yeah. For that much money, we could buy one just for fun. <laughs> Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right after bike night. Is that one electric? Oh, electric start. Okay, I was like 
The other thing, just real quick, since we're still in the in the news segment here, I did see that. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting because I am, you know, a big Triumph guy, being a Triumph uh, rider. But um, you know, the Thruxton's gone, right? Right. So now they're taking some of those Thruxton parts and putting them on uh, Speed Twins and Street Twins. Yeah, because so, the Speed Twin has the same engine, right? Mm-hmm. And it's also very light. I think it's actually lighter than your bike like yeah. by a few pounds. The Speed or the Street? The Speed. I think the Speed Twin is the one. Um, but they detuned the engine a little bit from the factory, if I remember. Oh, I know, like, because they, the they have the two versions. They have the... Um, they're both the 1200. They're both the same engine, but one they call their high torque, and the other one is the high horsepower. Yeah. Because the Bonneville had the... Yeah, 80 foot pounds of torque and 100 horsepower. Same as yours, right? Yeah. More or less. Yeah. 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 And I think you could actually, you could take that bike with a few mods and make it look a lot like your bike. If you put the bikini fairing on it, change that seat out, you know? Yep. It's a pretty similar bike. So, what the other difference on this versus the Thruxton, well, at least the Thruxton R, I should say. Um, now they're offering the upside down show of forks on it, like the Thruxton, and the adjustable rear shocks, like the Thruxton. Okay. So now you can get those on the Speed Twin. Right. So basically, they just combined them, Thruxtonizing them. Yeah. 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 And that way, if you're still looking for that that retro like, um, uh, yeah, cafe racer look, like you could definitely make that to a cafe racer, no, no problem at all. Yep. Never know the difference. And and it's like more powerful than like a Bonneville and lighter. So it's a little more nimble. Right. Yeah. yeah very cool. Because I, yeah, I remember I remember we went to that, I don't know if you went to it, that Triumph event they had up by the river there. They used to do those big events every year where they debut all the new bikes. And they had the, that was the year they debuted the, um, the Speed Twin. And I was pretty excited about it. And I was considering like trading in the Bonneville for it. Oh yeah, I went to that one. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a fun one. It was, it was on that, it was like above the boathouse, yeah. B- above the boathouse, yep. Yeah. yeah. That was a really nice event. Yeah, that was a very well... I miss Triumph doing those. Yeah, I know. All right, Don, get on it. Get on it, Don. Come on, man. Um, so does that wrap up? In the, no, it doesn't wrap up in the news. My gosh, we got lots of stuff for in the news this week. So not that I... I don't, I don't really care about Indian motorcycles, okay? It's not in my... Not, he doesn't mean Indian the company. He means India the country. Right. Yeah. Indian the country. <laughs> Right. We've been talking a lot about Indian mo- exactly. motorcycles. Exactly, yeah. Let's, let's specify which Indian we're talking yeah. about. Um, big motorcycle country. Oh, huge. I saw the number. They sell 18 million new motorcycles a year. Yeah, that's uh, that's insane. And they have three or four or five different manufacturers that are just in India. Well, this one company, Ola Electric, came out this week and said that they were producing an all-electric line of motorcycles for the global market. So they'd actually be available here in the US. Certified 112 kilometer range. What is 112 kilometers? Like 90? 50 miles? I don't know. I don't do metric. 70, 70 miles. miles. Certified 70 miles. Okay. It's still not that much. Does it have a swappable battery though? I don't know if it's swappable, but here's the kicker. It's under $3,000. Touchscreen, seven inch touchscreen TFT dash. Okay. Fully programmable mode riding and all this kind of stuff. Um, that, that would be fun, like if, especially if it charged relatively fast. Like if you had a short commute to either work or school or something, like you're a college kid. Um, and I brought this up because there are a lot of EV bikes out of, there. Is that, that bike? Is yeah, it? this is it. They're making a few different flavors of it. They That's a nice looking bike for three grand. And it's called um, the Roadster, the Roadster X, and the Roadster Pro. It's uh, one million rupee. No. Yeah, one one lock. So I asked my wife that that translates to, and it oh, it's eleven hundred. So that's considerably under. Yeah, so it was a little. It was a little over a lock, right? It was one point something right. something. So and plus maybe um charges for bringing it over yeah. here and that sort of stuff probably yeah but like up. you said three grand is wow yeah that's i mean yeah if you had a say you had a 30 mile commute like like my son goes to usf he commutes 
I don't want him riding a motorcycle every day, but if he if he needed transportation and only had three grand, you can get there and back every day. Yeah. With and no gas. My wife commuted to I wonder, college. What's the top speed on that? Does it say? Uh, you know, I don't know if it gives the specs on here. Like you know, can it shows a wheelie? Yeah. <laughs> AI can do amazing things with pictures. Let's see. Big TFT. So you can get different flavors of the battery. Battery capacity. Yeah. Yeah, I guess depending on which model you get. Like the most... The Roadster Pro 16 certified range of 579 kilometers. That's pretty far. <laughs> That's a legit um, distance. You could... They all have a touch screen, map navigation... So one reason I brought this up too, Brian, is that I've been reading a lot and seeing a lot about how EV cars and motorcycle sales are really nosediving over the past year um, to the point where a lot of people are speculating they're kind of just a, a has-been. Like maybe they were an answer to a question no one was asking. Right? Well, I don't think the demand was really there from the people. The government was kind of trying to force it, you know, with incentives and also like california made some law you can't produce any gas vehicles after 2028 or whatever the right which they're just gonna have to dial that back because even if they could produce enough evs to sell to everybody in california by then i don't think the power grid there could handle it at this point mm. they're not ready for it you know so i know texas power grid can't yeah i mean you see <laughs> what have... happened when they had that ice storm a couple yeah. years ago <laughs> We, we were living through it, man. It was rough. And they've got a pretty good power system there. And I don't think normally, right, it's taxed that much, but you have a natural disaster like that. Yeah. And something you can't predict, like ice storms, you know. Well, I want to, I wanna, you know, say that I'm not against any kind of propulsion, right? It's not oh, like no. I'm, it's not like I'm, oh, it's internal combustion or nothing for me, right? I don't care, right? No, I mean, I would, like you said, I wouldn't be against it. If, you know, the prices are the same, the range was the same, and it didn't take, you know, two hours to charge it, especially like with my job, I, I mean, I, I have a cargo van, so there's, you know, I couldn't, and I drive sometimes, you know, 150 miles in a day with a 4,000 pounds of cargo in my right. in my van. There's no way I, at this point they have batteries strong enough to do that, you know, on the day-to-day. But I think these electric bikes might be like, well, so who are they for, right? A lot of people say, well, because of the limited range, they're great for like urban mobility. Right. Okay. Well, that's true, but I don't see a lot of people riding not two here, wheel vehicles. Not in the states, anyway. Not in the states. Yeah, you go yeah. you go overseas, and it's a whole different story. Yeah. There's millions of so if it motorcycles and mopeds and whatever. Right. So if it helps bring down urban pollution. To get all those people onto electric, hey, more if, power. If to I them, lived right? in like a city like Barcelona or Madrid or something, I would definitely have a like a small displacement, either motorcycle or a scooter or something, just to get around on because you can filter over there. The traffic is atrocious in the city. I remember we were driving into Barcelona. We were only like twenty miles from our destination inside the city. Right. But it's like like the entire trip was say five hours, and now we're like an hour and ten minutes away, but we're only five miles from the end and i'm like why is the last five miles going to take an hour and a half but it was just because once he got to the city it was just gridlock you, you know traffic light traffic light and yeah. meanwhile the guys on mopeds and stuff were just buzzing around us and the light would turn green and they would all just take off and they'd be two lights down by the time we got to the next one right it's same it's same in india it's just you know that's how you get around is on two wheels for yeah sure. and of course they use them as like family vehicles yeah I've seen some pretty crazy videos where they have like the kids all stacked up on the bike, you know, <laughs> small bikes too. Yeah. Yeah. Even scooters. Scooters. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, did you happen to watch that Fortnite video that he just I put haven't out? watched it yet. No, I, I saw you sent the link to our chat. I think I, you'd find it very interesting. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it for you. Do you mind if I spoil? No. Go, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Paul Harris. Here we go. We're going to spoil something else. We're going to spoil something for you. So he <laughs> he talks about the new models coming from Can Am. Okay. Can Am, the legendary dirt bike Canadian manufacturer from back in the day. You they know? make snowmobiles. They make three wheel vehicles. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, that's another thing you got to watch. That Ari and uh, Zach video where they take the he takes a Can Am three wheeler off roading. Right. Yeah. Anyway. So. 
they came up with two models. Their, their platform, like we were talking about last week, so it's a it's a the same chassis and, and electrical motor, but they put different tires, different suspension on it to make one into an off road capable adventure bike, right? And one is like an urban mobility motorcycle. Um, he didn't care for the urban mobility motorcycle. I'll let him. I'll let you know, everybody watch it and let. Uh, yeah, he can give his summary of that. But he loved the adventure bike. Yeah, because they're light and tons of torque, right? Instant power. Instant power, and it had this trick way of the way they mounted the um, the motor. It it keeps the suspension level the same no matter how much torque you're applying to it. Oh. It's this trick technology that they have. Like it keeps it at ninety three percent, no matter how much you're. Anyway, he loved this thing, but he said he'd never buy one because it only had like sixty miles of range on it. He's yeah. like, "What are you going to do with this? You're going to ride it around for thirty minutes and then go home?" He's like, "By the time I get to my, the destination where I want to ride off road, I barely have enough juice to get home." Right. So it's tricky. It's a yeah. Unless you took it to an adventure park or something. Yeah, but what he does say is like they're setting up the technology for when the battery. I've seen some interesting, like, talk about possible interchangeable batteries. Swapping, yeah, yeah, where you Hot get swaps. almost like the propane tanks when you go to Lowe's. You, you just you pull up, you put your card in or whatever. The door opens. You take the battery that you're using in your bike. You put it into the charger. You take one out. Yep. And then, then you could just go. That's really the only at this point that I can see the only feasible way. Yeah, I bought an electric um, push lawnmower. Yeah, I have one. Two batteries. Yeah. Swap it out. Keep going. Yeah, that's the thing. I love it. It's great. It's quiet. Um, you know, you can just put some earbuds in your ears and you don't have to worry about not being able to hear everything. Like, even the chainsaw, I've got all the all this, and it all takes the same battery. And So my question, Brian, though, is, and I, and I don't want to get in the emotional aspect of like, you'll, you'll never get my, you know, gasoline powered engine out of my dead hand. Right. But I'm always thinking in terms of like transitioning, getting, getting new riders into motorcycle. EV might be that way to go. My wife was curious about EV motorcycles because no clutch to deal with. Right. You just twist it's and simple. Go. Yeah. Hop on it, twist it, off you go. Right. right? Plus, there's a young, um, a young generation coming up with electric bicycles now. Yeah, I, I mean, now like I don't see anybody riding regular bicycles on the Never. street. Never. It's all some kind of subsidized yeah. electric thing. Right. Pedal assist. So I did do a little Googling on that because I was curious. I said, well, what makes an electric motorcycle, an electric motorcycle, an electric bike, an electric bike? It's What's the cutoff there? Probably, well, one, you have to, be, you have to pedal to make those move, even if it's just cursory like you're doing it for show right yeah yeah and so they also have like of course because we have to just like with drones you know you've got these new technologies and you got to put some regulations around things because it gets a little out of hand especially when safety comes in because some of these electric bicycles can hit 60 miles an hour yeah now you're that is a motorcycle that's a motorcycle and you don't need it to take the MSF course. You don't need to wear gear with it and everything. Right, which I guess is kind of similar to like a scooter or whatever. I think you can ride that without a license, right? Like a moped or whatever. So they anything, limit... Anything under yeah 150 cc's or whatever. So just like that. So they're doing the same thing with the electric. It's like anything under 750 kilowatts yeah. is an e-bike. Right. Yeah. Anything over is a motorcycle, right? So, But it does vary from state to state, I read. Yeah. But I thought it was a good way. It might be a good way for people to transition into motorcycles. Right, because they get on it and they get, then they see their friends go off and, you know, ride for the whole afternoon. And then they're like, well, maybe I will take the class and get a, you know. Because people do that with small displacement. Go get gas a Suzuki bikes. Boulevard 250 or whatever. <laughs> exactly. It's like, because that bike isn't meant for owning. That's, you buy it, you own it for a year or two, you get used to riding, right. and then you sell it for your next bigger. Exactly. So maybe e-bikes, e-bikes will fit that niche. So uh, when we come back for a segment on a couple of things I watched, did you watch anything this week? Um, nothing worth note other than, you know, my, my hundreds of bizarre YouTube videos that I go down. <laughs> so before we get to our uh, 
our movie review this week, which is going to be Alien Romulus. Right. Uh, you sent you sent me a thing about a, a story you saw about adopting a writer on Facebook. I had never heard of this concept before, Brian. This was a post. Just you know how Facebook just puts random stuff yeah. on your wall. This was a post by a woman who was driving a car, and she took a picture of a young couple on a motorcycle um, in a medium light rain kind of scenario. And she said in her post, I followed this young couple for about 10 miles in the rain, and I didn't allow anybody, any other car to get in between me and them until they got off on the exit that they got off on. And she was so happy that she, what she referred to, she coined the phrase, adopted them, mm-hmm. right? Um, she was so happy, and then she wanted to, to spread that sentiment and, and encourage others to do the same. And I kind of dismissed this. I saw this a couple of months ago. But the thing that kept sticking in my head was the, the amount of attention that this thing got. Right. I swear, Brian, I, I wish I had it up. It had tens of thousands of comments. Yeah, it's crazy what things you see that that take off like that. It just it was just huge amount of and so I'm scrolling through the comments because I want to see what people because I have to admit I kind of scoffed at it. Yeah, like it when you first like, read some stuff, then like then you go into the comments and you're just like, oh. And these people were just like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing I've read. I'm going to start doing this. And then, of course, you have the people that are, um, you know, I lost my cousin on a motorcycle and I make sure that I always adopt them on the road. And even if they don't know you're there, keep in mind that they have loved ones at home that are waiting for them. And, and I'm, you know, I mean, it's, it was really this emotional. Yeah, impactful. It was like, wow, okay. So I'm starting thinking, you know, I'm like, well, for one, nobody's adopting me for long. No, I, I adopted somebody the other way around once when I was, I've told the story before, so I'll keep it short, but I was go- going through the mountains up in North Carolina on my way to Helen, Georgia, and I had a whole curvy route planned out, and then it started raining and it got all foggy and dark, like instantly where I couldn't see like three feet in front of me. And then I was now happy there was a car in front of me, whereas before I was aggravated because he wouldn't get out of the way. And I I just followed his taillights all the way down the mountain. Like, if he wasn't there, I don't know how I would have made it to the bottom because I couldn't keep my my shield from fogging up. I either had to open it where the rain came in or close it and let it get fogged up. So, right. yeah. So, anyway, I, I adopted him. He didn't know it, but... That's funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, thank, thank he, God you're there because I, I could see where the road is, you know? He's probably going, why is this motorcycle like, on my ass Yeah, I was, just, I was just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got, to, I got to the bottom of that hill and I just... I put the GPS on and I was like, all right, where's the highway from here? And I just, I skipped Helen that day and went straight to the, straight to back to Atlanta. Yeah. But. It's easy to kind of roll your eyes at, at that premise, but it's, it's, yeah, you don't I mean, want to be painted in a corner too of being a, an uncaring person. Um, I think it's fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it really depended on like the traffic and the highway you're on and, you know, how how hard the rain is because it also might freak the motorcyclists out if they keep looking back there and you're right on their tail. Exactly. I don't I don't like people riding. That's one thing that bugs me. But I don't. I ride a very. I don't want to use the word aggressively, but I ride. What's the word? Yeah. Well. Proactively. <laughs> proactive. Yeah, because you just don't want to be surrounded by cars. Yeah. I get. I make sure that I'm out of the way. I'm of happy. Trouble. I'm happy to go five over the speed limit all day. I'm not. I don't need to. I'm not like you know Reese. Hey Reese. I don't need to go 90 everywhere. You know what I mean? I'm happy to go 65 and a 60 or whatever, as long as I'm not surrounded by cars that could... You put yourself where you want to be. That's exactly. what I always say. Yeah, I, I will speed up to like 90 for like a minute and a half to get past everybody, and then I'll go right back down to 65. Exactly, and, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I thought it was an interesting kind of concept, and um, hey, you know, more more power to them. Right. Right. So uh, you... Went to the theater and saw a new release. Yeah, we, I actually, John sent a message into the group, anybody want to meet up for a movie? And so the wife and I went to see Alien Romulus. It's the latest sequel out of the Alien series, which if you, if you count the Alien and Predator one, there's probably like 10 movies, you know. There's Aliens 1, 2, and 3, and then there's the Prometheus, and there's Alien 4, and then there's the Alien versus Predator, and Alien and Predator, like... 
So do you know where this falls in the So this timeline? actually falls um, in between Alien and Aliens, which are the first two movies. The, yeah. So in yeah. that timeline. So in Aliens, when they go, when they go to that mining colony that's been completely wiped out by the aliens. Mm -hmm. And that's when they have the Marines with them and they, they get into a big shootout with like hundreds of aliens. Bill, that, Bill Pax. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Bill Paxton's in that one. That one takes place in the same place that this one does. So this is like, it takes place like 10 years before that happens. Basically there's these kids that are grew up on this mining planet and they all want to leave because the sun doesn't come up there and it's dark all the time and their parents have all died and they want to go to a planet that's like actual sunlight and stuff. Okay. And there's like this, Disabled Space Station, which is the Romulus Remus Station. Oh. That's where the name comes from. And they know there's some cryopods up there that they could steal that are still functional. And that way they could make the jump to the next planet. Because otherwise, because they'd be able to steal a spaceship or whatever anyway. Mm. So they go up there to try. And, and then, of course, the reason why this station is closed down is because there's aliens on it and everybody's been killed. <laughs> <laughs> and they kind of stumble into that. So it's actually really good. Um, it's kind of a hodgepodge of all the other alien movies, but it's really well shot. I think the budget on it was only like 80 million bucks. Wow. Which is insane because that new Borderlands movie that came out is, I think, $200 million, and it looks like shit. I mean, I don't watch it. I've only seen the trailers. But um, one of the YouTube critics that I um, that I watch just absolutely panned it. What, the Alien? No, no, no. Oh, oh, yeah, Borderlands. Borderlands. You know, Borderlands is hideous. Yeah, it's like 0% of Rotten Tomatoes or whatever. Oh, and the cast is like, the cast of this Alien movie is just literally like six really good-looking, like, 20-year-olds, you know, <laughs> including Dora the Explorer from the movie. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> Some really bad things happen to poor Dora. <laughs> but uh, anyway, if you're a fan of the Alien movies and you like uh, you like sci-fi, and I just can't believe they shot that for $80 million. It looks so good. There, There's like a ring around the planet that they're on, and they're kind of hovering right above it. And you could see like, you know, the, the ring is made up of you know rocks and asteroids and stuff. Right. And it just looks incredible. No, right? Ridley Scott didn't direct this, right? No, no. This was, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, F F Fedez, Fed, Fed Alvarez? No, I assume Scott's still producing it. Is yeah, he... yeah, because it opened with the Scott Free um, logo or whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. It, um, well, he might even own that franchise. He might, he might. Because he I... made. Uh, oh, what one thing that's interesting about it is, so in the original Alien movie, the first one, the android on board was named Ash. And hmm. It was played by a man named uh, David Holm, I think, H-O-L-M, British, British actor. He's in this movie, but he died like four years ago. Oh, wow. So they just recreated his likeness and his voice, and he's completely AI generated. Maybe they had an actor with like a, a skin on, like a, you know, like a green hat on or whatever right. but it works pretty well because you know he's supposed to be an artificial person anyway and um i mean a lot of the, a lot of the times they show him it's like on a tv monitor because they're talking to him throughout the ship or whatever mm -hmm. um but but this is a little bit more this is different than like a prometheus style alien movie right this yeah is more prometheus was like i don't know I, I just did not i know he was trying to be more heady with it and show like Origin, origins kinda, and all yeah. that stuff and you know god and man and all this stuff and they do have a little bit of that in here like they they mix a little bit like the only thing the only critique i would have with this movie is it had a pretty satisfactory ending and then they tacked another ending on it that didn't really need but does it does it ask any questions i mean do you get any any like space jockey because everybody wants to see like space jockeys right <laughs> like, yeah i mean it's it's not as um i mean they're they're so it is anti-corporation and all that because it's all about the Whalen Corporation or whatever. Right. These poor kids are basically slaves because the one that starts off with her going, oh, I've uh, completed my five-year contract, even though she's only 20 or whatever. And they're like, sorry, we had to extend everybody's contract. You're, you got five more years or whatever. <laughs> you know, you're stuck here for five more years. And mm. they just keep doing that to them until they die. And, you know, their parents had all died from lung disease from working down in the mines or whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, but it... It was, um, I thought it was really entertaining. A couple of good jump scares in it. Um, like I said, the the special effects and the, like, the scope of it, like the size of the space station and the ships and everything is 
pretty impressive for especially for the small budget does it mainly take place in the space station yeah or? it starts off in the mining colony for like 20 minutes and then they get up to the space station and the rest of the movie's up there okay so yeah yeah okay yeah but it's, it's really good so the aliens in the under the girder kind of the, under the grids floor grids yeah kind of yeah like it, it it shows you like the, the, the opening scene is like a little tiny thing where they they show the ship like collecting like an alien out in space which i think is the one that sigourney weaver's character flush out into space right they they find it and then that's the cause of this chaos because they're trying to you know they're always trying to i don't know weaponize it or whatever so. uh, a long long time ago like 15 years ago i i thought i read that sigourney actually owned part of this alien franchise too. she might have i mean she's been in a ton of them they're they're all pretty good like the only one that's kind of um I think Alien 4 kind of has like a low rating. That's the one that was like on the prison colony where she was like a... Um, was that the last one she a- acted in? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if this is going to talk about it. This is like her whole life here. But um, hmm. the, the other uh, slight recommendation I'd like to make is of a TV show that I just kind of stumbled on on Amazon. I think it's MGM Plus or something. It's called Free State. It's um, like a... Um, a spy thriller kind of thing really well done um british and english uh and american um like cia and the mi5 kind of working together to like cause these turmoil in these like middle eastern countries and stuff so then they could these big corporations can sell more more war Hmm. it's uh it's got a real like intricate plot but it's so is actually really easy to follow and the actors are all really um, what's it called free state free state yeah what streaming it's service? on mgm plus which i have on amazon i'm not sure if i pay extra for it or not it's one of those things where it's like it just pops up on my feed and it has two seasons out i think they're each eight episodes um it's got the guy from game of thrones that played gendry who was like the uh the bastard son of robert or whatever in, in the original series he was the one mm. that was working in the uh what do you call that um Forge. Like, he was like a f- weapons forger or whatever. Like blacksmith. Blacksmith. Kind of, yeah. 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 So he's in it, and Mark Strong's in it. Who, if you've watched any movie that has British people in the last twenty years, he's you, you'll recognize him. Um, but it's really. And then the second season has Walton Goggins is kind of like the main person in it. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's great and everything. Yeah, but not. There's only like a couple of characters you might consider good guys. Everybody else is kind of gray, like just doing some hideous things. You're just like, oh my god, and. I mean, it's kind of like, did I say Free State? Free State. Deep State, yeah. Deep State. I, okay. I think Free State is like a movie or something. Yeah, Deep State. My apologies. Yeah. It sounds like, Free State sounds like a yeah, I was Ben like, Affleck journalist movie. Yeah, or no, this, this, this Deep State is like a, because it's you know, like a conspiracy theory kind of thing. You're, you're kind of getting like a look behind the scenes of what the CIA is up to in these countries. Got and, it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and the big corporations and how they're, they're all so interwoven because like people... They leave the CIA and they join these corporations, and they still they get hired anyway. So they're still working with the same people. Yeah, I love CIA manipulative. You know that this this show will give you all that, that puppet you can master stuff. But it's not like some of those shows, like the the Jack Ryan show on Amazon. Although it's pretty well done, a lot of times the story is so freaking confusing. You're just like, I don't have any idea who these people are or what the hell they're doing. And this show, like, even though like it has a complicated plot, it's really easy to follow. So. Anyway, that's another recommendation I would give. Well, we told our buddies we'd be at bike night at 7. Yeah, so we so should get going. We need to ride fast. We're going to get going. All right. Look for uh, some video from that ride. and Leave uh, us a comment, subscribe, do all that stuff. Do all the good stuff. Yeah. If you want t-shirts, let us know. Yep. And uh, go ride a motorcycle. See you.